Hey everyone. All right, here's a, just a quick slide. I forgot to tell you this information about that face recognition disorder, prozo, prosopagnosia. Uh, read this. You'll have a question about this on the quiz tomorrow, probably on the big test on Monday. Now we have hearing. Uh, what a great discussion we had in class today. I wish I could have answered all of your questions. And hearing is just such a positively fascinating um, sense. It, it's really amazing how all of these things work. So let's try to get to the bottom of it. So we hear sound waves, and just like from the vision lecture, the height of the wave gives us the amplitude, and the frequency of the wave gives us the pitch of the sound. So amplitude determines the loudness of the sound wave, so the loudness of the sounds that we perceive, and the frequency determines the pitch. Long waves, low pitch, short waves, high pitch. Here's a visual ear flap, outer ear. Then we have the canal. Here we would call this the minor, e sorry, the middle ear. And you need to remember eardrum, anvil, stirrup, um, and their functions. And then we've got the inner ear. Um, this right here, the eustachian tube. Uh, when there's ear infections, this is the area that is blocked. This is where drainage occurs. So I did upload two little uh, videos on on Moodle, their YouTube videos, and they give you a pretty good answer for your questions about the tubes in your ears um, and um, what happens or how you get an ear infection. Uh, I thought it was interesting. Quick, short, um, good enough to get a good. So the important thing you need to know for the AP exam is this process of transduction again, and this is in the ear. So we've got the sound waves coming in, they hit the eardrum, then the anvil, then the hammer, then the stirrup, and then that oval window. And when they come in, everything is vibrating. Then the cochlea vibrates. So thinking back to that diagram, the cochlea is that curled up part of the, the ear in the inner ear. And by the way, when you're thinking about this, we hear by that air pressure changes in the sound waves and also that bone conduction, so you feel the vibration. And the cochlea is what is lined with the mucus called the basilar membrane. And this is that process of trans transduction. So the basilar mem membrane, there's hair cells. And the hair cells start to vibrate. Then those vibrations turn into the neural impulses. And these are called organ of corti. And once that becomes a neural impulse, then it's sent to the, to the thalamus and then up to the auditory nerve. Or I'm sorry, not up to the auditory nerve, but up the auditory nerve to the thalamus, and then generally it would go to the temporal lobe. And that sound itself is measured in decibels. Um, so just for your information, zero decibels is considered the absolute threshold for hearing. Would Remember that term, absolute threshold, that would mean then that you can hear about 50% of the sounds at zero decibels. And so that means you do hear things even more quiet than that, but you can hear 50% of the sounds at, at zero decibels. Now, 20 decibels is about the sound of a whisper. And if you go from zero to 10 to 20, it doesn't actually increase by 10, it increases exponentially. So 20 decibels is actually 100 times louder than zero decibels, that absolute threshold. A normal conversation is about 60 decibels, so that would be like um, 10 to the sixth power times your absolute threshold, if that makes sense. Um, and if you consider like a passing subway train, that's a, more around like 100 decibels. Now there's a couple theories about pitch, about how our brain perceives pitch that you need to know for the AP exam and for your big quiz on Wednesday. Or not Wednesday, I'm sorry, on Monday. So we have two theories, the place theory and the frequency theory. Let's start with the place theory. If you consider the cochlea, the place theory um, states that different hairs vibrate in the cochlea when they hear different pitches. So if you think about the distance around the cochlea, some hairs, um, this theory would state that some hairs vibrate when they hear really high pitches um, and others vibrate when they hear low pitches. So we have different hairs that perceive different types of pitches. Then we have the frequency theory. 
um, this idea is that all the hairs vibrate, but they vibrate at different speeds. Whoops. So when you evaluate both of these theories, um, research would say that the place theory works to explain how we sense high pitches, and the frequency theory works to explain how we sense low pitches. Now how does this actually work? Because if you look at either or, it's quite problematic. We have something called the volley principle. Um, so think of like soldiers alternating firing, so some can shoot while others reload. Um, this principle is saying that neural cells alternate firing um, in the similar fashion. So um, by firing in rapid succession, they can achieve this combined frequency. So um, we would use the pitch theory at the same time as the frequency theory, and the volley principle is the concept that there's a combination of the two theories that handles um, the intermediate range. Now you're probably curious about deafness. How is it that people lose the ability to hear and what kinds of deafness exist? So first there's conduction, <clears throat> excuse me, deafness, and this is where there's problems with the actual mechanical system that conducts the sound waves to the cochlea. Something goes wrong with the sound and the vibration on the way to the cochlea. This is actually um, fairly easy to to help somebody hear. You can you might have to replace the actual bones um, in the ear, or you get a hearing aid to help. And there's a nice hearing aid for you. Um, then there's something called nerve or sensory neural deafness, and this is where the hair cells in the cochlea get damaged. This is um, a little more serious and actually loud noises long, uh, can cause this type of deafness and you can't actually ever replace the hairs. So the, the one solution or the way around that would be the cochlear implants that we talked about in class today. So there's a, an image for you. Um, I know that's a little gross, but um, you can you would just in with an individual who has this kind of implant you would see um, that outside feature. Here's a picture of somebody with a cochlear implant. Just, there we go. Um, so that's an infant um, probably born with some kind of disorder and the parents chose to put the cochlear implant in. And, and there are a few students here at Blaine High School you may or may not notice that have that device. So one thing um, about cochlear implants, they are a, a bit controversial actually. Um, a parent's decision to allow their child to have that um, if a person is born deaf, um, many people in the deaf culture don't consider that a disability. Um, and in fact, uh, deafness from the deaf culture, people might even consider them to be visually enhanced. Um, because they cannot hear, their other sense of vision is much, much better than other people. And you could argue, and some psychologists have proven in some studies that when you lose one channel of sensation, it does seem to compensate with a slight enhancement of other sensory abilities. Um, I guess you could think about you know, various examples of this, but maybe just a real basic one is um, when you're kissing somebody, why is it that you close your eyes? Um, so you're, you're maybe trying to pay attention to those other sensations. All right, we're going to move on to the other senses. <clears throat> if you have questions about this, please write them down on an index card. Um, bring them to me tomorrow. I'll do my best to answer them. Now we have touch, and we have receptors located in our skin. Any sensation on the skin can basically be summed up with our four basic skin sensations. There's a sensation of pressure, of cold, of warmth, and pain. Ask me in class tomorrow about tickling. Why is it that you can't tickle yourself? It's a perfect example of bottom-up processing versus top-down processing and this concept of perception, which, which we'll talk about in class tomorrow. Now, what's most important for the AP exam is the concept of pain, and you need, to, you need to know the gate control theory of pain. It probably would be helpful if you read over that in your um, blue packet as well. So this concept, or this theory, says that the spinal cord contains a neurological gate, there it is, when the tissue is injured, so that the small nerve fibers activate and open the gate, and that's how you feel pain. Now the large nerve fibers, the ones that are responsible for all, most every other sensory signal, their activity closes the gate, which blocks pain signals and prevents them from reaching the brain. So when a higher priority message is sent, the gate swings open for that message, and then it swings shut for a low priority message. 
So this theory explains why if something itches, you got a mosquito bite, um, you scratch an itch, the gate swings open for your high intensity scratching and it shuts for that low intensity itching. That's why a scratch can make you feel better, make your itch go away. And if you think way back to the biological unit, unit two, and you think of neurotransmitters, uh, we talked about endorphins and we sometimes talked about the high you get if you run or if you exercise. Those natural endorphins in the brain are chemically similar to opiates like morphine. Um, they control pain. They actually act to swing the gate shut. Now remember there isn't actually some kind of gate um, inside of your nerves. Um, near your spinal cord, but this is just a really good way to understand this, the way that we perceive pain. Now let's talk about taste. I wish we had more time to talk about this because I love to eat and I think taste is fascinating. Ah! <laughs> okay, let's start with the bumps on our tongue. They're called papillae and we have taste buds located all over there and they're actually all over your mouth. There they are. And there are five ways, there are five sensations, ways that we perceive taste. They're sweet, salty, sour, and bitter. And there's actually another one called umami. And that's the, the sensation that's like savory. Uh, maybe MSG is a good example, or fish, fish sauce is another, Parmesan cheese, some of those strong, savory types of flavors. There, fix that one. There's umami. Now people vary in how they taste food and their ability to taste food. Um, and this is based on how densely packed the taste buds are. So if there's a very, very dense taste buds, the more chemicals are absorbed and the more intensely the food tastes. Um, so uh, after the AP exam, we'll do a little test and see who our super tasters are in the room. And these are the people who have very, very densely packed taste buds and they're able to taste food much better. Now, when we think of the flavor of food, it really is a combination of taste and smell. So when you, many people ask the question, well, why is it that the older people need to put so much salt on their food or, or seasonings? A lot of times this isn't because of the taste buds. Usually it's because of the sense of smell. Uh, I don't have a slide for smell, so make sure you read that section in your packet um, and you un understand or you're able to look at that diagram and understand the system of, of smell and the receptor cells. And um, just one key information is um, that the sense of smell is the most primitive sense. And this is why the olfactory neurons, so the smell neurons, bypass the thalamus. They don't go to the thalamus, all the other senses do. And they go straight to the brain, uh, they go uh, straight to the temporal lobe. Uh, for processing. So there's two more senses that you're probably aware of but never actually consciously think of um, and, and we consider these the body position senses or the spatial sense. So there's a vestibular sense and there's the kinesthetic sense. When we talk about vestibular uh, I'm talking about um, this sense that tells us where our body is oriented in space. So this is your sense of balance Ah, and I talked about this in class today, so that's actually located inside of your ear, the semicircular canals inside of our ears. Um, this gives us that sense of balance. And then there's the kinesthetic sense, and this tells us where our body parts are. And the receptors here are located in our muscles and our joints, so unlike skin, like the, when you think of the sense of touch, the skin receptors, um, or the touch receptors are right outside of your skin. These receptors are in very specific locations. So there, there is a rare disorder um, of individuals who have lost the nerves that enable kinesthesis. And can you imagine this inability? This is, if you have no ability to sense the position of your limbs, you would feel very disembodied, like the body is dead, not, not your own. And it's almost like you're, you know, this, this being that's floating around your body. It, it, it's a very difficult experience. Okay, that's it for the lecture for today. Make sure you read that packet if you haven't already, and we'll talk about perception tomorrow.